So you're thinking about getting a home battery for your solar setup to cut down your power bills because the Australian government is funding one third of the cost of a new battery. Now comes the hard part. Between all the jargon, DOD, VPP, AC versus DC coupling, it can feel like you need an engineering degree to make a choice, let alone understand what's going on. So don't worry, in this video, I'll break it all down in plain English, or at least in my weirdo accent, and by the end, you'll know exactly what to look out for in a home battery, how to decode the Turk terms, and how to utilize your battery to make the most of it. So we have a lot to go through. Make sure to like and subscribe, and of course, if this video helped you, then support this channel with the links below. Let's jump straight in. Let's start with the battery jargon. To clear up uh, two key tech terms you'll hear all the time. First of all, depth of discharge or DOD. This is about how much of a battery's capacity you can use. So if a battery is 10 kilowatt hours and has 80% DOD, you shouldn't draw more than eight kilowatt hours from it before recharging. Using more could shorten its lifespan. A high DOD means you can use a larger slice of the battery pie. Many modern lithium ion batteries boast around 90% DOD or even 100%, meaning you can use almost all the energy stored without worry. Secondly, we have round trip efficiency or RTE, which is in the same vein in regards to percentages. No system is perfect. Whether you charge and discharge a battery, some energy is lost. Round trip efficiency tells you what percentage of energy you put in that you get back out. For example, the Tesla Powerwall has about a 90% round trip efficiency. Put 10 kilowatt hours in and you'll get about nine kilowatt hours back for use. The rest is lost as heat or conversion. Higher is of course better. A 95% RTE battery wastes very little, whereas an 80% battery loses more. Most home batteries today have RTEs in the 90 to 95% range. So first off, don't accept a battery lower than 90% on either of these specifications. More than likely, it'll be older technology, and even if the price is better, don't do it for long-term sake. Beyond cutting power bills and gaining energy independence, and yes, I haven't forgotten, another major reason Aussies turn to home batteries is for backup power during blackouts. But here's a pro tip, not all battery systems automatically power your home in an outage. Standard grid connected solar systems, even with a battery, are designed to shut off during a blackout for safety. You don't want solar panels pushing power into the grid while line workers are fixing faults. So to have power when the grid is down, your battery system needs blackout protection, aka backup mode. A battery with blackout or backup capabilities can isolate your home from the grid and supply energy to your home circuits when the grid goes line. Essentially, it creates a mini local grid just for you, and this usually requires a special inverter or a backup gateway device. If backup power is crucial, for example, you work from home or have medical equipment, make sure to choose a battery or inverter that explicitly supports blackout backup. Now, some batteries like the Tesla Power will come backup ready by default, while others might need an extra piece of equipment adding to your battery costs. Not only that, they generally only power a certain circuit inside your home. You see, battery backup is usually limited to the essential circuit, like your fridge, uh, some lights, and maybe Wi-Fi, because internet is important, unless you invest in a much larger system. So during a blackout, you can't run your entire house like it's a normal day. Heavy hitters like the aircon or oven might not be covered unless you have a big battery and inverter setup. But having the lights, internet, and kettle running when the rest of the street is dark that's a huge win. Now onto phases, single phase, three phase, what is going on? And this is of course dependent on your own home setup. Australian homes have either single phase or three phase power delivery from the grid. Most homes are single phase, meaning all your electricity is supplied through one phase or one cable at 230 volts. In this case, choosing a battery system is straightforward. A standard battery inverter, which is single phase, will integrate into your homes one phase just fine. 
For those with three phase homes, you are essentially receiving three active wires delivering power to your home, allowing heavier loads to be distributed. So if your home is three phase, you have to plan a bit differently. A single battery inverter can typically only connect to one of the three phases. That means if you install a battery with a single phase inverter on a three phase house, it'll only supply power to that one phase. So in a grid outage, only that phase and the circuits on it get power backup. And during normal operation, the battery will only reduce usage and bills on that phase of your supply. And this is critical and your installer should catch this early, but it does mean a more expensive inverter and battery potentially. So for optimal performance, you will need to get a three phase battery and inverter that can supply all phases at once. The main takeaway here is if you have a three phase home, discuss with your installer. Make sure your battery solution is designed to cover all those phases and that it will back up the most important circuits for your home situation in case of a blackout. Now then, AC versus DC coupling, two ways to connect a battery and neither are actually wrong. So let's talk about how a battery hooks into your existing solar power system first. You might hear about AC coupled versus DC coupled batteries. This sounds a little bit arcane, but it's basically the difference between connecting on the AC side after inversion or on the DC side before inversion. And to be clear, this has nothing to do with the Tenet movie. So here's the simple version. When installing an AC coupled battery, you're adding a battery as a separate appliance to your household AC circuit. If you already have solar panels and a solar inverter, an AC coupled battery can be added without changing your existing system. The battery charges by drawing AC power, which your solar inverter produces from your panels or from the grid and converts it to DC to store, then discharges it by inverting DC back to AC for your home. The advantage, easy to retrofit and works with any solar system since it's independent. The downside, every time energy is converted from DC, the panels to AC the house and back to DC the battery and then to AC again, you lose a bit. So AC coupled systems tend to be slightly less efficient overall. And typically an AC coupled battery system has an efficiency of around 90 to 94%. That means if your solar panels generate 10 kilowatt hours to charge the battery, you'll get roughly nine kilowatt hours of usable energy back after accounting for the round trip loss. Now with DC coupled batteries, it means the battery is connected on the DC side, usually directly to the hybrid inverter or through a charge controller. Your solar panels feed DC power and then DC can go straight into the battery, usually via an inverter or charger device without first becoming AC. Then when the battery discharges, one conversion to AC happens to supply your home. The benefit is high efficiency and less double Double conversion losses and DC coupled systems can reach around 96 to 98 percent efficiency in power transfer squeezing more usable energy out of what your panels produce. However, DC coupling is trickier to retrofit. It often requires replacing your existing solar inverter with a hybrid inverter or you must have a compatible system already. Also having one combined inverter means a single point of failure. If that inverter goes down and solar and battery both go offline, whereas an AC coupled solar inverter and battery inverters are separate. So you see, neither AC nor DC coupling is wrong. It depends on your situation. If you have an existing solar system, an AC coupled battery with its own inverter is usually the simplest add-on, and that's probably what usually gets sold. And if you're installing a brand new solar and battery system, a DC coupled approach using the hybrid inverter might save you some conversion losses and possibly some cost. Either way, modern systems are pretty efficient. It's a few percentage points difference. Now, speaking of inverters, a hybrid inverter is essentially brains of a solar and battery system combined. So why all this talk of hybrid inverters? Well, for one, they simplify the system. There would be fewer boxes on the wall. Equally important is the intelligence they add. Hybrid inverters often come with software that lets you optimize your energy use. For example, you can program time of use settings, charge the battery from the grid during cheap off-peak hours, and then use the stored energy when rates are high. The hybrid inverter automatically switches between using solar power, then drawing from the battery, or even topping up from the grid based on the schedule or strategy you get to set. This is perfect for taking advantage of time of day tariffs and solar generation during the day. When choosing your inverter model, here are some key features to look out for if you want the most flexible solution. Make sure it supports both on-grid and full off-grid 
operation. It has high peak and continuous backup output for example, let's say five to 10 kilowatts. So it can comfortably run essential appliances during an outage like your kettle or your microwave. It offers integrated energy management features like smart load control, EV charger integration, and solar diversion for hot water. Make sure it comes with a native app and remote firmware updates, ensuring you stay current with new features and bug fixes. It is a piece of technology after all, it needs updates. And make sure it's compatible with major battery brands, as you may not always get the same brand battery as an inverter. It really depends on the options your installer has. Lastly, make sure it has a strong warranty. 10 years plus is usually ideal and make sure it's backed by a company with local support and of course, proven age. You don't want a company that's 12 months old supporting your brand new install that's supposed to last more than 10 years. So how big should your battery be? Home batteries are typically measured in kilowatt hours, so K W H, which tells you how much energy they can store. And picking the size isn't one size fits all. It depends on your usage and what you want the battery to do. First of all, you need to know your own usage. Start with your average daily electricity use. Check your power bill for the figure in kilowatt hours per day. In Australia, a three person household uses about 18.7 kilowatt hours per day at, on average, and a four person household around 21.4 kilowatt hours a day. And five or more people might be high roughly 25 kilowatt hours a day, but your own usage, again, depending on the climate appliances that you might use and whether you have a pool or electric heating, it all makes a big difference. Next, uh, decide on the goal. Do you want the battery to cover all of your usage when the sun isn't shining, which would make you almost self-sufficient or just handle the evening peaks or just as an emergency backup? For maximum savings on a solar system, many aim to use the battery to cover their nightly and evening consumption. For example, if you use 20 kilowatt hours a day, Day, uh, perhaps eight kilowatt hours of that is used after sunset. In that case, an eight to 10 kilowatt hour battery could zero out your grid usage most nights. It's often recommended to go a bit higher than your current needs. And here are some of those reasons. You don't want to routinely drain the battery to 0%. Having extra capacity means less stress on the battery. Using say 60% of a larger battery each night instead of 100% of a smaller, it can extend the battery life. But let me make a quick note here on battery life. Lithium ion batteries, like the ones used in most home storage systems in Australia in the last couple of years, typically last around 10 to 15 years and beyond, which is much longer than traditional lead acid batteries like the one in your petrol car, which usually lasts five to 10 years. Now that doesn't mean your battery suddenly dies after 10 years. What it means is that the battery's capacity gradually degrades over time. By year 10 or 15, it might only hold around 60 to 80% of its original capacity. So instead of storing 10 kilowatt hours, it might only store six or seven. It'll still work, it's just not as efficient and you have less storage. Also, your 10-year warranty usually covers a battery that degrades faster in that 10-year period. For example, below 70%. This is the same warranty for electric cars. And you would call that a faulty battery if it degrades faster than it should. Eventually, after enough charge and discharge cycles, the battery won't be practical to use and that's when you'd consider replacing it. Luckily, most of these systems come in blocks, so five kilowatt blocks. If you've got 15, you'll have three of these and you might only need to replace one. And not because it outright failed, but because it just no longer holds enough energy to be useful. So getting a few extra kilowatts now during the rebate period means more life for the overall system, more than 15 years. Okay, with that out of the way, here are some more reasons. Your usage might grow. Kids get older, hello more gadgets and longer hot showers. Of course, seasonal changes. You might use more power in winter where it's darker for longer. So a bigger battery can cover those longer nights. And then in summer, you might not use the full battery every day. And that's absolutely okay. Overall, the incremental cost for a slightly larger battery might be worth it for the added flexibility and of course, backup time. So if you typically use, let's say five kilowatt hours between sunset and bedtime, 
and another three kilowatt hours overnight. A 10 kilowatt hour battery comfortably covers that with a little bit of buffer. Another rule of thumb, about 60 to 80% of your average daily use in kilowatt hours is a decent battery size to significantly reduce grid dependence. Of course, bigger batteries cost more. So it is a balance. You don't want to pay for capacity you'll never use. And many Australian homes opt for batteries in the 15 kilowatt range, finding that it covers their needs well. For most suburban grid connected folk, it's about shaving off those peak times and having overnight power. Also consider your solar array size. You need enough solar to fill that battery on a typical day. No point getting a 20 kilowatt hour battery if you only have a small three kilowatt solar system to produce 10 kilowatt hours a day. You'd rarely charge your battery to full. Now, a quick note on choosing an installer. Here's one golden rule. Experience matters. The solar and battery industry in Australia has boomed and busted many times and not every company sticks around. So when selecting who will install your battery and solar, if you're getting that too, look for installers or providers with a solid track record. Companies that have been operating for many years and have good reputation. Longevity is a good early indicator of reliability. They likely offer proper support and honor warranties if they've been around for long enough. So check reviews, ask about their accreditation. CC accredited installers is a must. And don't be shy to ask for referrals or examples of their work. A home battery is a significant investment even with these rebates. So a quality installer and after sales support will ensure your system runs safely and efficiently for the long haul. Remember, a good installer will only do the job right, but also help educate you on using the system to its fullest. So pick someone you feel comfortable with and who doesn't dodge your questions. So there you have it, a crash course on choosing the right home battery in Australia. With the rebates around, I think a lot of people will be really interested to understand how to do it. So let me know your thoughts below. Thank you very much for watching. Of course, if you found this useful, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more videos like this. Thanks and bye.